Well, how are we all doing this morning? We doing good? We doing good? You know, after singing that song, it reminds me of Pastor Aaron said at the end of Sunday school this morning, how we can go out and we can be champions of the gospel. And aren't you glad that we can champion something that's already been won? The victory that's already been won? Praise the Lord for that this morning. What a joy that is. And what a joy it is to be here this morning, finishing up our Habakkuk God is Greater series. I hope you've been blessed by this book. As we have often said, Habakkuk may not be a book or a prophet that when you ask the average person, hey, uh, what do you think of when you think of a prophet? Or what do you think of when you think of a book in God's word? Habakkuk may not be the first place that we turn. But as we've seen through this series, it's a short book that's filled with so, so much. And it tells us so, so much about God. And I'm thankful for that. I, I truly am. I'm thankful because studying this book and reading through this book has once again reminded me that, and I hope that, and this is my prayer for you as well, God's word is God's word, as Pastor Aaron shared with us during announcements. And no matter where we are reading, no matter what we are going through, God's word is all about him. And when we get to read his word, we get to learn about him, we get to grow in our love and our knowledge of him, what better thing is there? Amen. He gets the glory. He gets the praise. So as we wrap up Habakkuk this morning, I want to briefly do a flyby of where we have been in this book and what we have seen. As we know, Habakkuk comes to God at the beginning of chapter one. We read this from Habakkuk. How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? and cause me to look on wickedness. Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists, and contention arises. Now, the very first message in this Habakkuk series, we said that this is Habakkuk going to God and in reference of the wickedness of God's own people, Judah. They are in a bad state, and Habakkuk, in his sensitivity to sin, goes to God questioning and wondering about if and when something will be done about this wickedness. How long, O Lord? Violence is all around me. Wickedness, strife, contention, it's all on the rise. Then God responds to Habakkuk in 1.5. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places, which are not theirs. Oh, something's going to be done about the wickedness of Judah. And it's going to be in the form of God raising up what we now know to be the Babylonians, that empire. And that's unexpected, right? If you think about it from Habakkuk's standpoint, it's like, you're going to deal with wickedness by sending them, this wicked nation? Yeah, you would not believe if you were told because it's unexpected. But this is God talking to Habakkuk about what he would do. And what God is going to do, we can trust, will always be greater. The last part of Habakkuk 1 through the opening of chapter 2 is Habakkuk trying to come to terms with the idea that this wicked nation and wickedness in general seems to swallow up the righteous. When you think about the Babylonians, right, they are so evil, they're so wicked, yet they seem to be thriving, at least on earth. What's the deal? Where's the justice? How can God use them? And and when we look at our world today, when we see wickedness on the rise, it's like, what's going on? What are we seeing? But the wicked will meet their end. Wickedness doesn't win. It doesn't thrive, and it doesn't pay. In chapter 2, God tells Habakkuk to record the vision, because what he is about to say, what he's about to reveal to Habakkuk, is going to take place. It is a certainty. Verse 2, 3, it's a guarantee. God's word, what he reveals, what he says he will do, take it to the bank. It's a guarantee. It's a certainty. The proud and the arrogant one, the Babylonians, the wicked, those who would rebel and reject God, their soul is not right. 
and they will be dealt with. In fact, chapter two shows us how the justice of God is always greater. God's going to deal with the wickedness. God's going to have the victory. God is going to win. He is a good God. He's a victorious God, as we just sang about. Sin and wickedness will be punished. So there's no use in choosing that road. But the second part of Habakkuk 2.4, a verse that we see quoted many times in the New Testament, and we'll frame even what we will talk about this morning. But the righteous will live by his faith. That's a complete and total contrast from the wicked. The wicked choose themselves. The wicked choose sin. The righteous, however, choose a life of faith. Trusting in God, no matter what. Yeah, Circumstances may not be ideal. Wickedness may be on the rise in the world. Things look chaotic, but the righteous live by their faith. The righteous choose the Lord. And this becomes a truth and a verse that is quoted in the New Testament because it's a foundational doctrinal truth. Because when wickedness defines the world that we live in, when chaos rages, when trials come, or whatever the case may be, know this. Faith is going to define and characterize the righteous person. The one who is so in tune with the Lord that it is all about him, even when we don't perceive things as being ideal, right? Let me ask you this this morning. Has every single thing that you have ever experienced in your life been ideal exactly the way that you would draw it up? Have you ever faced a trial? Has anything ever happened that's like, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. I know I need to trust you with this. Because here's the truth in those times. God is always greater. Amen? We saw four reasons last week in Habakkuk 3 that show this, right? His mercy, his glory, his power, and his victory. This morning, we're going to put a bow on that and give final reasons on why you can have faith in the God that is greater, truly. Truly, he is greater. But before we do that, a little history this morning. And when I say history, a little history lesson, I know automatically some of you are already fired up about that, right? History, yay, we love it. But most of us are undoubtedly familiar with Benjamin Franklin, right? We all, we all, know, we all know Ben. Um, He was a founding father, right? What's interesting though, in addition to be a founding father, Ben Franklin was also a writer, a scientist, an inventor, a statesman, a diplomat, a printer, a publisher, political philosopher, and the first postmaster general. Makes you wonder what Ben wanted to do when he grew up. But part of his role was being a diplomat, as I mentioned, and he had a great relationship with France which during his time there as a diplomat, he was a diplomat to France, he helped secure the military alliance with the newly formed United States and France, which helped in the Revolutionary War cause. At the time, France was home to many philosophers, many big-brained intellectual thinkers, many of which were cultural despisers of the Bible. Franklin himself was not a believer. We have no record of him believing in the Lord. And we have no evidence that leads us to believe that he ever got saved. I mean, only the Lord truly knows. But even as an unbeliever, Benjamin Franklin had an admiration for the Bible, and he was curious. So he frequently read it. He he thought that there was something, maybe something to this. Um, He just kind of, he loved what the Word said. And he especially did not like the objections that those in Paris had to the Bible. So you have these intellectual philosophers who just all about philosophy, all about culture, all about what's the newest thing. And they would raise a lot of fuss with Benjamin Franklin over the Bible. Like, why would you read that? Who would read that? You can't believe that what that says. So one day, Benjamin Franklin wanted to prove a point, and he wanted to see how much these philosophers knew or didn't know about the Bible. So he came to one of their gatherings one night where they would often meet, and he said he wanted to share something that he had been reading, but he didn't say what, and he didn't say where he got it from. 
because he had been so impressed with the majesty and the beauty of this particular text that he had read, so he wanted to share with them, and he wanted to test them. And they wanted to hear it, right? Somebody just comes to you and says, this is majestic, this is beautiful, this is wonderful. What are you reading? So he read it to them, and what did he read? Habakkuk 3. This text, mainly the end, he read it to them, and they received it with exclamations of adoration and admiration. What a wonderful passage. They wanted copies of it and wanted to know where he had found it. And obviously, the text mentions the Lord and it mentions God. So you would think, being the big brand intellectuals they were, they would have figured out that maybe he was reading something from Scripture. But this also shows you the force of Habakkuk 3 and the message, particularly the end. I find it very interesting that even intellectuals that have no desire for God, that have no desire for his word, can hear the truth without even knowing it and be like, hey, that's really something. I share that to say, hey, it's kind of a cool story. I mean, here's Benjamin Franklin, you know, reading the Bible. But also, what reaction should we as the church have in response to the incredible truth of the word of God especially what we will see this morning at the close of Habakkuk. I mean, if unbelievers can read God's word or hear it and be like, you know what? There may be something to that. How much more should we, as followers of Christ, love his word? Love what our Lord has revealed to us, what he has given to us. Are we fired up and are we truly passionate about the Lord and his word? I mean, are you fired up about his word this morning? Are you fired up about your Lord and your Savior? I pray that that is true of every single person in this room. In fact, as we get started this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning. Lord, we sang about your victory. We've sang about your gospel, the truth of who you are. We've given praise and we worship your name this morning, Lord. But I pray that right now you bless the hearing of your word. Lord, your word is a blessing. It's a treasure. And it should point us more to you every single day, Lord. And and the more we learn, the more we know about you, should drive us to a greater love of who you are and a greater passion to go out and share your truth with a world in desperate need of it. So, Lord, this morning, bless our time with one another and may your word go out. Lord, and may it accomplish what you wish to accomplish this morning. And it's in your great and matchless name that we pray. Amen. This morning, we are in the second part of our two-part wrap-up on Habakkuk. Thus, the title this morning is, Is He Greater? Part 2. So look at Habakkuk 3, beginning in verse 16. I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones. And in my place, I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail, and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. For the choir director on my stringed instruments. Brothers and sisters, this is such a beautiful passage. It shows us who the Lord is, and it shows us how we can always run to him and always find ourselves in him, no matter what. Because if you think back to how Habakkuk begins and then read this, right? At first, Habakkuk's going to God and saying, God, how long? How long will the violence last? Wicked is all around. And now you think about this, it hits deep. And I think it hits deep because it hits home. Because obviously this prayer from Habakkuk is in the context of his own nation and his own people coming under judgment for sin and judgment for wickedness. Which obviously leads to captivity and desolation. But if you look at our world today, is there not wickedness that's all around? 
are things good in our world today? I mean, can you turn on the news and be like, wow, that's pretty encouraging. That's pretty edifying. There's a lot of good going on. I mean, there is good going on, don't get me wrong, but the general tone, the general theme of what we see in our world today is what? It's chaos. It's discouragement. Another attack. Another crime that's been committed. Back in April, Pew Research did a poll. And and while polls aren't representative of everyone, uh, Pew Research does a decent job in illustrating certain things. They have good methodology. They have good representation. So these results are probably a pretty good reflection of the general attitude or perspective in our country today. Did you know that 58% of U.S. adults say that life is worse than it would have been 50 years ago? And projecting ahead, 66% believe that the economy will be weaker in 25 years. 71% of U.S. adults believe that the U.S. will be less important worldwide in 25 years if the Lord hasn't returned by then. And get this, 77% of U.S. adults right now, as of this year, believe that this country will be even more divided than what it is right now, 25 years down the line. It's all so encouraging, isn't it? I mean, you read and it's like, yay. Well, that's the point. None of this is new. It isn't like this nation or this generation found some long lost utopian society, perfect world that has never before been seen, at least since the garden. I mean, just look at Habakkuk's words. The issue isn't what is happening in our world. The issue becomes for us Christians, what do we do And how do we respond? Do we trust in the Lord with this? Or do we cave in to the discouragement? That's where we want to focus. What should our response be? And the focus is and always should be on who? The Lord. He is the one that is greater. He is the one who has the victory. He is the one who is sovereignly in control even right now. He's never not been in control. He's in control right now, and he always will be in control because that's who he is. This morning, we can trust again that God is greater because of his ways. Because of his ways. That's the first reason. You know, in Habakkuk 16 and 17, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. This is Habakkuk's response to to God. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. And wait a second, you're thinking, How does this have anything to do about the ways of God? But remember, this is Habakkuk's response to what God said he's going to do. Right? We know Babylon is coming for Judah, and then we know what God is going to do down the road with Babylon and what he's going to do with the wicked. There will be a day where the goodness of God, I mean, it's showing now, but where it will fully show, and he will overthrow enemies. But from Habakkuk's perspective, the day of captivity and judgment is still coming for Judah. This puts Habakkuk and anyone really in a position where they either have to choose to trust God in his ways or give in to the world. If you put this on a spectrum, right, you have a long line, a long spectrum, and over here you have the natural results of a sin-ridden world. Disappointment, discouragement, depression, anxiety, Fear, and not the fear of the Lord, but the fear that cripples. And truth be told, it makes sense because if you don't have the Lord, if you don't know Christ, you probably really aren't fearful enough about what you see happening. You probably aren't fearful enough about your eternal state, about your very soul. That's one side of the spectrum, the disappointment, the discouragement, the fear, the anxiety, all of that. And the other side is a much more beautiful picture. 
you can choose faith. You can choose trust, belief. Basically, you can choose God. We are told that Habakkuk's response to the revelation from the Lord is that he trembled in his inward parts. I mean, can you imagine you, you get the revelation from God like Habakkuk did, trembling in your inward parts? I mean, when you think of trembling, what do you think of? We're also told his lips quivered. And this isn't an abnormal response to God and his word and his revelation. In fact, the book of Daniel, we know of what he heard. Pastor Aaron's brought it out a little bit in the Win Jesus series, but we know what Daniel saw, what he heard, the visions and, and what God sent to him. And in fact, Daniel 7, 20, 28 tells us, at this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me. And my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So there is a response when you, what you see from God and what you hear in his word that we see all throughout the prophets, what we see in scripture of there being a little bit of a, whoa. Oh, what did I just hear? Like, this is the Lord's word. And then check out what the Lord says about how one should respond to his word in Isaiah. For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, who trembles at my word. There's a faith and a trust required when it comes, when you hear the word of the Lord, when it comes to his ways, to trust and to wait on him and to wait on what God is going to do. See, we live in an instant gratification culture where it needs to be right now. I need the answer to this right now. I need to know what God's going to do right now when the reality is he's told you what he's going to do. Have faith in his goodness. Have faith in what he's going to do. His ways are greater. And we know Habakkuk is a prophet, right? We know his love and his heart for the word and for the Lord. He is going to wait on the Lord. He is going to wait quietly for what the Lord is going to do. In fact, many translations, other translations say that he will wait patiently. But if you take his situation and you take this spectrum of sin, chaos, fear versus faith and trust, and you can see how for many, if all they see is what's right in front of them, if they take their focus off the Lord, you can see how somebody's response would not be a godly one. Them? You're going to use them? This is what you're going to do? Oh, we can say we're all about the ways of the Lord. We can say it. We can say it all day on Sunday. We can say it every single day of the week. It sounds good. We want that. Lord, I'm all about your ways. But then the verse 17 of life comes. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, Though the yield of the olive tree should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. That's a pretty comprehensive statement of genuine fires and trials in life when you look at it from Habakkuk's perspective. Because there are six statements here, and they seem to be in ascending order of severity. With the loss of figs ranking least, and the loss of the herd in the stalls causing the greatest economic damage. To break this down, think about what Habakkuk just says, what it says in verse 17 in the context of that time. Figs served as a delicacy in Israel. But their loss didn't necessarily produce severe hardship. Now, it's not convenient, but it's a loss nonetheless. And you move on to grapes. They provided the fruit of the vine, what was needed for the daily drink of the time. But again, the loss of the fruit of the vine, right? It's not going to produce devastation. It's just going to be a little inconvenience. Something you just got to deal with. Olives produced oil for cooking and lighting. The field produced grain, which was needed for the daily diet. So the failure of the fields to produce food might mean start might mean starvation for large segments of the population. Okay, so now we're, we're getting a little bit more on here in terms of what's truly being lost, what truly they would be without. 
both sheep and cattle made up much of the wealth of the times. Like that's something you just had to have, right? You had to have your herds, you had to have your cattle. Sheep and goats also provided the wool and the occasional um, other uses as well for the Israelite. Obviously Hebrews did not normally eat cattle, but they were used for preparing the soil for planting and heavy work. So now you're getting into the economy, right? Now the economy is starting to not be affected when with a back comprehensive statement. The loss of any of these individually that's mentioned in this verse, that, that might be survived, right? You can do without this, and you can do without that, and, and maybe without this for a little bit of time. It's not ideal, but it's not a big deal. But together, all of these losses spelled economic and social and life disaster. Literally, it is devastation. Habakkuk is going to the fullest extent here of This is losing almost everything. And we know it's a result of sin. It's a result of judgment. So how does all of this show how God's ways are greater? There's one little word here at the beginning of verse 17 that Habakkuk starts off. The first word of that verse, 317, is though. Which means that with all of this happening, if and when it takes place, though it does, though trials are coming, though... Circumstances could be bad. There could be struggles. There could be just a bunch of chaos, a lot of destruction. Though all that takes place, something greater is going to happen. Someone greater is in control. Yes, that trial may be taking place. Though it is, something greater could be happening. And it's true in Habakkuk, as we will see momentarily, and it is still true. See, where is your confidence? in those times. Is it in the God who is greater? Or is it in the world? His ways are greater because there will be an end to the affliction one day. That is a certainty. But his ways are greater because even when things are tough, even when affliction is happening, we can still choose him. We can have faith. And we know, I mean, we say we know, but do we truly know this morning and do we truly believe that God is working and God is doing something? Are we, when we praise his name, when we give him worship this morning, when we bless his name, is it with the trust and the faith and the belief that Lord, even if my life right now, if there's something going on, even if if I'm discouraged by what I see in the world, Lord, I choose you. I choose to live by faith in you. He's doing something. Even when it is bad, he is good. He is greater because his ways are greater. That's the first reason his ways. And we look to the second and last reason this morning, but before we do, look at how this beautiful, beautiful book closes. Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet. And makes me walk on my high places. Or the choir director on my stringed instruments. This is so counter to the trials mentioned in verse 17. But it's, it's how I pray I would respond to a trial. And I pray that's how we all would respond to a trial. Like, Though this may be going on, though all this may be happening, I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That is a godly response to the Lord and to his word. Despite all of that, God is worthy to be praised. Is he worthy to be praised this morning? Amen. Despite the worst economic disasters possible, despite the absolute worst it could get for Israel, the prophet would rejoice And he would remain faithful to the God of his salvation. He is still better. He is still greater than all of that. Though he might lose everything, Habakkuk, though though somebody may lose everything, which normally brings life and joy, though that may happen, guess what? You don't lose everything when you still have the Lord. In fact, you have all that you need. Habakkuk vowed to rejoice in the Lord. I love how he says, I will exalt in the Lord and I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. 
I just think that there was a whole lot of praising going on with Habakkuk at that point. Almost makes us all wonder, do I rejoice in my God like that? Do I exalt in him? See, there are many, many reasons for such a hope that we have in the Lord. God is good. We know this. But look at where Habakkuk faces this, faces his hope, faces his rejoicing. I will rejoice in the God of my what? Salvation. God is greater because of his salvation. That's the second reason. Are you thankful for the salvation of the Lord this morning? I mean, it is why we can gather here as brothers and sisters, right? We can praise his name and we don't have to worry about, you know, the, about whether or not we'll see those mansions of glory and endless delight, like what we just talked about, right? The mansions of glory, the streets of gold, the victory in Jesus. He's told us in his word, because of our salvation, we will see him in glory. We just talked about that Friday night at communion. But I have to tell you, humans, us, we this morning are so prone to self sometimes, so prone to sin, that something pretty miraculous sometimes has to happen for us to have this type of perspective when genuine trials happen. And praise to him, something miraculous has happened. Jesus Christ, the cross, your salvation, your justification, your sanctification, your glorification as we just celebrated at communion. We see Habakkuk's resolve to not merely rest in the Lord's will through everything that would happen, and come to pass, but to fully rejoice in the God of his salvation. See, if you ever wonder what's God doing or what has God done, I hope you never do, but just think about to he saved you. Does it, that's a miraculous work of God because it's something only he can do. And Habakkuk also knew that Israel's covenant Lord, their God, was yet on the throne still. And brothers and sisters, I've got news for you. On the throne, he still remains. The trials of life and what they bring, they should not be minimized. There's genuine heartbreak, sorrow, sadness that comes during trial. But the question is, am I going to have faith? Am I going to trust in the God who has saved me? The God who, even though I was still a sinner, he died for me. He died for you. And if he did that, I can trust him. I can have faith in him. I can be the righteous person that lives by his faith, as Habakkuk says. The God who loved the world, that he sent his son into into it, that whoever would believe in him won't perish, but have everlasting life. That is your Lord this morning. That's the God who is greater. This is the connecting point of Habakkuk 2, verse 4, with what we see this morning. The righteous will live by his faith. Is it always easy to have faith in the midst of a trial? No. But we are told that we can rejoice in the God of our salvation just as we are told that we can have joy and that we should consider it such when we face trials of many kinds. Where else in the world do you get that? That's a beautiful truth. That's an assuring truth. But where else in the world is going to teach that, yeah, I know you're going through a trial, but you can still have joy. But that is the blessing and the beauty and the treasure of God's word. Because God's using it. God's working. God is good. So Have faith. Rejoice in your Lord. Because here is the reality that's true all of the time. Trial or no. The God who has saved you is also your strength. The Lord God, as Habakkuk refers to him as. And I love this because the NIV translates this as the sovereign Lord. It's the only place outside of the Psalms that the phrase sovereign Lord occurs at least in the NIV. It expresses the divine yet personal nature of God preceded by his title. 
The name emphasizes the power and the majesty of God. See, Habakkuk knew, I can trust in this God, my God, my Lord, because he's sovereign. Oh, what a beautiful truth is that the God who is oh so personal, that you can have a relationship with, is also the sovereign God over all the universe, the creator, as our brother Vince has walked us through in this Grace Origin series. To have a God of such power and beauty and majesty that also has saved us and invites us to come to him. Because it is only through the Lord that we can have the sure-footedness in life. Like that which a deer has. Have you ever seen a deer? I mean, if you're, if you're out in nature and you see a deer and they, all, they go through the woods and all these slopes and just the way they move and it's because it's the way they were created. And that's the imagery that Habakkuk brings forth here. It's only through the Lord that we can walk on high places in an unsure world. You want to have sure-footedness in life? Choose the Lord. You want to slip and stumble? Well, the world does a lot of that, and the world is very good at doing that. Do we always have a reason to rejoice in the Lord? Do we always have a reason for joy? Do you have a reason for joy this morning? Amen. We all do. It's our salvation. Are you thankful for that? Truly, truly thankful. Let's talk about a perspective shift, right? Where would we be without the Lord? Where would we be without the gospel? the good news. Do you ever think about like, what you were before and now how through that the Lord is transforming you even as we speak? It truly is good news. The best news. So where is your focus going to be? Where is your perspective going to be? Right? Trial or no? If you're on the mountaintop and things are going good, your, perfect, your perspective of the Lord should be the same as if you're in the valley. Are you going to look at what you see in the world and focus on that? Maybe even turn to some of those things and allow anxiety, frustration, disappointment, discouragement, etc. creep in? I think there's enough of that going on. I think there's enough of letting sin in. Instead, maybe we should have this. Or are we going to look upon him who is greater, the one who has saved you. See, the world brings disappointment. It will and can never be fulfilling. It's going to bring those things. It won't fulfill you. It, it may seem okay for a while, but eventually it's, it's not going to lead to, to what you want. It's not going to fulfill you. But if I look to the Lord... And think about the salvation that only he brings. If I keep that ever present in my mind, praising God for it daily, the very first thing that you do, uh, several months ago, I know in Grace Intercessors, Pastor Aaron said, do you thank God the very first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? Are we that thankful for what he has done? Because if we are and we thank him for that and who he is, I know I can have joy no matter what. He is worthy to rejoice in. I can rejoice in the God of my salvation because if that's all that God ever did for me, it's not. But if it was, and if it's all that he ever did for you, again, it just seems weird to say because it's not because we know how good God is. Then we are blessed so far beyond anything than what we actually deserve. He is greater because of his salvation. And he is greater because of his ways. Habakkuk had a front row seat to this. Are you thankful for the God who is greater? As we turn and head for close this morning, there are responses that I believe that we all should have when we think about the truth that our God is greater. These responses should come out of a heart that wants above all things to please and glorify our Lord, who is greater. Do you want to please him this morning? Do you want to glorify him with your life? The first response then, spend time with the Lord. 
Just spend time with the Lord. I mean, we say it and it sounds so simple, but just do it. We started this Bible reading plan, as you heard earlier, Built by Grace. And what a beautiful name for a ministry that talks about being in the Word of God. We are built by grace, but when you think of grace, we're undeserving of that. There are many benefits to reading through the Word of God, but first and foremost, when you read through the Word of God, you are spending time and learning about the God of the Word. And does it get any better than that? I mean, what else could we be doing or would we rather be doing than being in his word? Learning about the God that is greater. The God that even though trials come, even though things in life may happen where it's like, how am I ever going to get through this? He's still greater and he's still with you and he's still good. He's still sovereign. In fact, commentator James Montgomery Boyce once said, the knowledge of God leads to joy in him. And joy overcomes fear. But where are you going to get the knowledge of God? And better yet, where are you going to go or turn to when things aren't ideal? Be in the word and let his word work in your life as you apply it, as you seek to live it out. Because when times of doubt and discouragement come, where's your anchor? I mean, those things are inevitably but inevitably going to happen, right? There will be a trial. The believer needs to come to the Lord. We need to turn to him. Like Habakkuk, we need to hear God's word, get a glimpse of who God is over and over and over again, and come to a place of renewed and continued trust in the one who alone is truly God and therefore sufficient for all of life. Spend time with the Lord. Be in his word. Next. Rejoice in the Lord. It's one of those things we talk about. We say, I want to rejoice in the Lord. I want to give him praise. I want to find my joy in him. But, but, But take a moment right now to think. Think about this. Or better yet, if you're a note taker or if you have your phone, sometime here in the next few moments, minutes, write down one way that you can intentionally and proactively rejoice in the Lord this week. What does that look like? Or maybe the question that is better asked this morning, is there even a desire to rejoice in him? Are you finding joy in him? Or are you burdened with the trials and the disappointments of the world? Do you respond the way Habakkuk did? That even though all this is happening, I will exalt in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. There are many burdens. There are many who turn to those burdens of the world and and allow that to rule and reign in their life. Maybe if that's you, the response this morning is a prayer that you would find joy in the Lord. I mean, only the Christian, only the believer can say that no matter what happens in life, no matter the trial, no matter the circumstance, I will have faith that God is good. I know he's good. I'm going to have faith that he's good because of what he has done for me because of my salvation. Lord, your ways, even if I don't know, even if I don't see, even if I don't even understand or comprehend because we can't really comprehend, they are still good. He is still good. Is he good this morning? Oh, he's so good. Is he worthy of rejoicing in? So let's delight in the Lord. Let's not talk about it. Let's do it. Let's be a church that rejoices in the Lord wherever we go so that people know they love their Lord. They love him. Let's take the attitude and perspective of David in Psalm 27, 13, where he says, I would have despaired. I would have unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. See, there's just two choices. I mean, it's choosing the Lord, finding joy in him, or, or it's choosing the despair of the world. Here's another real life example. Uh, I remember as a kid, my grandpa telling me this story uh, because it led to the writing of what is his most favorite hymns. Him, it is his favorite. And maybe many of you know this story. But back in the 1800s, there was a 
a successful young businessman who lived in Chicago, who was a devout believer. One of his closest friends was actually none other than D.L. Moody. And, and this, this young businessman had gained quite the fortune through his business, right? He, he had a lot going for him, great business, even dabbled a little bit in law, financially stable and wealthy, and, until he lost it all in the great Chicago fire of 1871. And, and even prior to this, he had actually lost a son. He had a son that perished. So knowing he needed a getaway and a break after losing everything, this gentleman decided that he was going to plan a European trip for his family, his wife and four daughters in 1873. But due to some last minute developments and having to arrange some business and, and still kind of recovering from the loss, he had to stay behind and he had to send his family ahead of him and he would meet up with them in Europe. Well, at some point across the Atlantic Ocean, the ship that was carrying his family struck another vessel and it sank in just under 15 minutes. Several days later, the survivors of the tragedy, those who did survive, had landed in Wales. And this man's wife cabled back to him in Chicago and said, saved alone. Meaning all of their daughters had perished. So he lost a son, he lost everything he had in the fire, and now lost four daughters in a shipwreck. This man was Horatio Spafford, and upon receiving this news, he immediately left to join his wife. It is believed that at some point during his crossing over the Atlantic, where the best that he could reason, the ship that carrying, carrying his family had sunk and where his daughters had perished, he penned the now well-known hymn, It is well with my soul as he approached the area. Spafford and his wife would have three more children, one of which would die of scarlet fever. Did he face trials? Did he face anything in life that was difficult or challenging? Yes, he did. But did all of this tragedy detour Spafford? Did, did this devout believer then get stuck in depression and hopelessness? And discouragement? Or did he continuously look to the Lord, still finding joy in him? Well, later on in life, he and his wife and their um, new children moved to Jerusalem and continued to serve the Lord. And we are still singing the great hymn that he prays today. Many generations have since been blessed with the words and the truth of that hymn. We truly have to consistently think and constantly reflect upon what the Lord has done and his character, who he is, the love that he has for us. That will give us great cause to rejoice always in the Lord, and it will allow us to sing and praise God as Horatio Spafford did in the moment of a trial to be able to sing, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Is he greater? Is there a reason to rejoice in him? Amen. Right. As the praise team gets set to come up, let's look to, and let's praise the one this morning who is greater. Let's worship and let's sing this song that we just heard, that we just was referenced. Like we truly want to rejoice in him. Like we truly find our joy in him. And let's sing like we believe and love what we are singing. Amen. Because I know we do. I pray that we do. Let's glorify the Lord. Lord, this morning, let us continuously look to you. Lord, as your word says, though, though things happen and and, and a lot of it could be brought upon by our own sin, Lord, and just the results of a sin-riddled world. Let us look continuously to you who is greater, and let us continually rejoice and find our joy in you, in you alone, because you have saved us, Lord. Lord, we have a great, great salvation, a miraculous work that only you could do because of the love that you have for us. Lord, so as we praise you and worship you, may that be our heart to truly want to just glorify you and give all that we have, Lord, to you, to praise.
praise you, to rejoice in you. Lord, we pray all this in your name. Amen. Mm-hmm.